chapter six is all about the normal curve. And you are already familiar briefly with the normal curve from what we did a few chapters back. But now we're gonna start looking at families of normal curves and start dealing with some word problems that go along with them. Now, first off, a normal curve is a bell-shaped curve, and it has roughly this shape that we see here, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, we are not allowed to ever say that a distribution is normally distributed. We can say that it is approximately normally distributed. We can say that it is symmetric, that we can, we can say that it is bell-shaped, but we can't physically say that a distribution is normal unless a word problem tells us it's normal or some other conditions occur. Now we have four basic properties here, and we first off say that the total area under the curve is equal to one, and that way we can represent this as 100%. The curve extends infinitely to the left or the right along the horizontal Z axis. Now the Z axis is specifically for the standard normal curve, which we'll define in a little bit. The curve is symmetric about zero, meaning the standard normal curve is centered at the zero, and most all the data lies between negative three and positive three. We've already learned that almost all the data lies within three standard deviations to either side of the mean. Okay, now I've already talked a little bit about the language here. We tend to talk about the phrase being normally distributed or approximately normally distributed. And bottom line is each one of these curves is defined by two key values. The value of the mean saying where it is centered and the value of the standard deviation which describes its um, spread. So those are really the two values that we need to be able to do some conversions in mathematics, identifying which curve it is. Now we have a process known as standardization. Think of the black curve, the standard normal curve here. Well, that's not the standard normal curve because it's not centered at zero. But if it were two units to the right, it would be centered as zero, but that's the basic shape. But they come in tall and skinny and shorter and wider types of varieties. But we are able to standardize them, move them all onto a similar scale using the standardization process that we learned previously, where we have x minus x bar or mu divided by s. Now, that was a formula from chapter three coming back to visit us here. And basically, we're saying once standardized, we're on a z axis, whereas above, this was on x axis. It wasn't the standard normal curve. It had different centers um, there. Now, a couple of key facts that we've already learned in chapter three, if you were to add 10 to each observation in a data set, the mean would increase by 10. Okay, remember how I had my fingers up and we moved it left and right? We can shift the distribution, but the spread of the data is going to remain the same. The shape is remaining in intact. If you want to, in the second bullet, combine two distributions together, you're not allowed to add their means and standard deviations together. You have to deconstruct the data, go back to the original values, and then regroup them together into a single data set. On our calculator, we will be in the distribution menu, which is found above the VARS button. VARS stands for variables. And when you get into that menu, you will see the first three items are normal PDF, normal CDF, and inverse norm. We will never be doing the normal PDF function. That's the probability distribution function because that actually asks us what is the height of a curve at any particular point. We are not interested in the height of the curve. We're gonna be interested in the areas beneath the curve and that will be the normal CDF function and then likewise the inverse norm function. So those are the two functions that we're only involving ourselves with in this chapter.
Now, when you hit the normal CDF button, if you have a built-in menu, it's gonna ask you for lower bound and upper bound saying, I wanna find the area between here and there. And it's gonna ask you for the mean and the standard deviation. If you do not have this built-in menu, there still are four numbers that need to be entered and you would just have normal CDF like you see at the bottom of the screen here with an open parentheses. And then you would manually type in the lower bound, comma, the upper bound. And then you don't need the mu and sigma if they're zero and one because the default values are zero and one. But if they aren't zero and one, then you would need to enter those in the third and fourth position. Now, Texas Instrument has decided that we're, they don't want to use the in, infinity symbol here to represent negative infinity or positive infinity. So instead, they're using this negative one EE9 notation. Now, let me open up my calculator briefly for you and show this to you. I'm gonna hit second distribution, go into that menu, go into this normal CDF area. And it's actually got some numbers already typed in there, which I'm gonna clear out while I have to type something in. So here we go, negative, make sure you're not using the minus button. And then I'm gonna type in one, and then I'm gonna hit second EE. Above the comma, you see two E's, but when you hit the button, only one E shows up on the screen. And then we can hit nine, nine. And that's going to stand for negative infinity. And here I've got the positive infinity typed in likewise. So this is basically, it doesn't matter what the mean and standard deviation are going to be. Let me change them to zero and one. Basically, this is going to tell us all the area under the curve adds up to one when I hit enter. And there you have it, which is proof of one of those properties that we had stated. Now, we'll get some practice in this. And you are familiar with this picture that we see up here with the 68% of the data values within one standard deviation, then 95, then 99.7. But notice the values are a little bit more exact here than they were back in chapter three. Back in chapter three, we just used 68, 95, 99.7 as the empirical rule. And now we're going to get a little more specific. If I wanted to verify this, and you can do this on your own, to verify one standard deviation out, we have 68%, we'd say do the normal CDF function between negative one and positive one. That's negative one is a lower bound and one is an upper bound. Basically, I'm doing the blue section up above in this picture when the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And know that notice how we're getting that 68.26%. Likewise, if you change out the negative ones and positive one into a negative two to positive two, there's our 95%, and here is our 99.73%. So here we are verifying this using our function that we've just learned on the calculator. Now, if you're a little confused, Hang on, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper here. We are basically learning the building blocks right now, which are going to be used in this chapter and then built upon in future chapters. So what you have next is some basic practice dealing with finding some areas to the left of, between, and to the right of some particular Z values. And notice how in the directions here, I said, find the shaded area under the standard normal curve. Anytime it says that we're dealing with the standard normal curve, that basically tells us, hey, mu is gonna be zero, and the standard deviation is gonna be one. That's just the automatic basic standard curve that we're dealing with. Now, you do not need to draw pictures, but I find that it's incredibly helpful here. I've drawn a picture here for the, we have our normal curve and you've got some vertical lines in here so you can more easily see the one, two and three standard deviations to the left and right. And this one asks us to find the area which I've shaded in there to the left of negative 0 0.105. Well, you know negative 0.1 is just a little bit to the left of center. So that's why I've got that pink vertical bar drawn there. And we're shading everything to the left of that. 
That means my lower bound is gonna be this negative infinity and my upper bound will be the negative 0 0.105. So on the calculator, we're gonna enter, for most of us, what I have on the second line, negative 1E99 is the lower boundary, negative 0 0.105 is the upper boundary, and then mu and sigma. Now, if we did have this infinity symbol on our calculator, we would use that. Um, and it is on the TI uh, 89 calculators, but it's not on the most of your calculator models. So when you end up doing that, the value you should be getting is 0 0.4582. And let me make a comment here. This is another video where you're going to want to do every calculation um, on your own calculator. And I'd actually ask you maybe on parts B and C and in future problems, maybe try and pause the video, draw a picture, write down for yourself what you're typing into your calculator and trying it before I even go and do it, because that's where you're going to learn the most. For problem B, I'm giving you a betweenness. I actually want you to find the area between these two markers here, and I've given you the lower and upper boundaries. So on your calculator, this is what you're going to be typing in. It goes from negative 1.1 up to 2.06. The smaller number always on the left, followed by the larger number, because we're going from a lower to an upper bound. And because it's the standard normal curve, I'm ending with the 0 and the 1 in those last two positions. Now, you're probably already pausing this and checking your answer. And I'm just going to tell you, rounded to four places, we get this 0.8446. Now, when it comes to finding the area to the right of some value, in this case, 247, I went a little bit about, about two and a half standard deviations to the right. I drew my pink bar. I shaded into the right of it. And I'm going from 2.47 on up to positive infinity, which I'm writing as a 1E99. One of the good reasons to have these pictures drawn is it helps you with estimation. If your answer is, you know, way over 80%, you know that that's not going to match in this particular problem. Our answer is going to have to be a rather small percentage. So I'm going to tell you that I would either go 2.47 on up to infinity or 1E99. We're going from our lower to our upper with 0 and 1 as the third and the fourth number. And I don't know what that little minus sign stood for there, so I'll take it away. So now our answer on this problem should be 0 0.0068. And you can see that that picture I've drawn might be a little bit exaggerated because it looks like I've shaded more than, a, you know, 0.68% under the curve. Um, so sometimes they're exaggerated a little bit in our pictures. Um, now, whenever you are doing these problems, people sometimes get confused with the infinities. Think of a number line here, negative infinities on the far left positive infinity is on the far right. Anytime you're doing an area to the left of a value, it's going to start at negative infinity. Anytime you've got a betweenness, you'll just have the two numbers that we're dealing with. But anytime we have a, a greater than problem that goes off to the right, then your upper bound will always be this 1E99. All intervals go from small to large, just as the number line ranges from small to large from left to right. Okay, that was the forward direction. Now we're gonna move on to the backwards direction. And even though I don't have this written in your notes, I've got something covered up here that I think is really something you should understand, okay? You use normal CDF, which we just did, whenever you are given an X or Z value and you're being asked to find the area or the probability. We were earlier just finding the areas under the curve. Now, in the inverse norm process, inverse means to undo, we're going in the other direction. Given the area or the probability, or sometimes a percent value, find the x or the z value. And it's pretty straightforward. You go into your calculator, into that inverse norm menu, which was just beneath the normal CDF. When you do that, you're going to come up with this screen. Now, 
it's going to depend upon your calculator. Some of you are going to have a left, center, right if you have a newer calculator. Some of you are just going to have the word area, mu, sigma, and then that left, medium, middle, right is going to be missing there. If that is the case, then it's always going to be assumed that the area by default is going to be to the left underneath the curve. Okay, and then if you have an even older calculator, when you type inverse norm, you don't have a menu, it just says inverse norm, you're going to enter first the area. And if it's under the standard normal curve, you're done because they will assume that mu is zero and sigma is one. But if mu and sigma are different, then you would enter those two values next, just like we have up here as three separate inputs. So that's how you do these on the varying calculators. Now, what we have right here that I've typed in that wasn't in your notes, you don't want to get these two mixed up with respect to each other because that really tells you when do I use one as opposed to the other. Normal CDF is when you are finding the area. Inverse norm is when you are given the area. And sometimes it's easier to just focus on one thing finding the area or given the area. And the rest just kind of falls into place after that. So let's move on to some examples that go along with this. The first problem says, find the value of the 41st percentile for a normally distributed population with a mean of 88 and a standard deviation of 17. Well, first off, this is not going to be under the standard normal curve because it's not centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. The second thing you need to do is have an understanding of what a percentile is. If you score at the 41st percentile, it does not mean you got a 41%. It means you scored above 41% of the rest of the people. It is a relative ranking, above 41% of the rest. And that's why when I draw this picture in here, I've shaded in about 41%. We use the Greek letter alpha to represent area on a lot of these problems. Typed, it looks more like a apple, but really it looks more like a fishy. There's my alpha is 0.41. And I'm trying to find this x value. I know it's centered at 88, but I don't know, question mark, what is that x value that has 41% to the left? Now, having drawn this picture, I know that my answer is going to have to be under 88%, or not 88%, under the value of 88. So that's one thing that I can do. To, if my value comes up above 88, I know we've done a problem that, that made a mistake. And so that's why it's good to have a picture. So for this problem, because I'm given the area, whoops, I'm going to do the inverse norm. I'm going to enter this 41%, which is the area to the left. I'm going to enter the mean and the standard deviation. And then if my calculator has the word left, I will choose left. If you don't have that on your calculator, that's the default value anyways. So you just close the parentheses after the 17 or not need to enter it at all. And when you do this, it's going to come back and tell us that that value is 84.1317. Notice how 84 is to the left of 88, and that is consistent with what I said we would be expecting to find on this problem. So I have another problem here, but it's going to have a little bit of a twist in it. Again, we're given a normal distribution with a mean of 88 and a standard deviation of 17. Find the value of x that has 11% above it. So above is the key word here. And we can easily draw this picture. And I've got 11% shaded to the right. Now, if you've got the ability to type the word right into your calculator, because that's on that menu, you're in great shape. But for the rest of you with an older model on your calculator, these inverse norm problems are defined with the area to the left. So you have to go 100% or 1 
minus that 0.11 to get us down to 89% falls to the left of whatever this X value is that we're trying to find. So on our calculator, we're either gonna type one of these two things. You're either gonna, in the first position, have 0.11 if you can state, hey, this is the area to the right, or you're gonna enter in one minus the 0.11, or you can physically just type in 0.89 if you can do that in your head, and that'll be the area to the left. Now, again, if you have the option to the right, then you pr pretty much you're not gonna want to subtract. And if you, bottom line, the word left is optional there because it's a default value for those of you who do not have that on your calculator. In either case, we should be getting the same answer of 108.8510. Now, on this problem, I wanted to remind you something about the rounding rules. The nine falls in the fourth position out there, and it's the seven that says, hey, we're going to round up. But nine is already at the highest value, so you can either say it turns to a zero and then we carry a one, or you can say the 0, 9 gets raised to a 1, 0, a 10, at which point the 0 at the end is an ignorant, significant 0, and you have a choice of whether you want to leave it on or off your call. But the main point of this is I wanted you to see how we handle the problem when the area is defined to the right of a certain x value. Continuing on here, we already know that we're only focusing on our menu on these two positions, normal CDF and inverse norm found in that distribution menu. And I just wanna give you a little bit of a description of what this notation means. When I am at stating Z subscript 0 0.08, I'm talking about the Z value that has 8% of the area shaded to its right underneath the curve. So that's what that notation means. Now, I said, while the problem may be defined as having 8% to the right under the curve, it also could be thought of as having 92% to the left. But typically when we have a positive Z value, it's the area to the right, had I wanted to refer to the area to the left, it would have been a negative Z value. So if I had a problem, for example, where I drew a quick, quick picture and I wanted to shade in a left tail right about here, and I told you that I've just shaded in, I don't know, 7%, that would be the Z value at the bottom here would be Z, I'd make it a negative Z, subscript 0 0.07. And because it's a negative Z value, we know it's to the left of the center. And that in this case, it will be the area to the left underneath the curve. So I just wanted to introduce this notation with a Z with a subscript because we will be seeing it quite a bit in future chapters. Continuing on now. I'm mentioning here that the standard normal curve already has mu equals zero and sigma equals one, but there's a whole family of normal curves, okay? We've got tall, skinny curves, we've got shorter, wider curves, et cetera. All of them are considered normal curves and only the standard normal curve has mu equals zero and sigma equals one. Okay, so I'm breaking out of the standard normal curve mode. Let's deal with a couple problems with just a normal normal curve. Find the area between three and 11 and a half when the mean is 11 and the standard deviation of is four. Now, picture not necessary, but sometimes it helps to have this here. So I've drawn a picture and I've said, okay, Here's my mean of 11 in the center, and I just want to go from 3 to 11.5, which is a little bit more to the right. Now, very crude drawing. Obviously, it's not great artwork here. But when I go to do this on my calculator, because I'm finding the area, that tells me it's the normal CDF function. And then I need a lower bound and an upper bound. There is my 3 and my 11.5. And then I enter my mean and my standard deviation. 
at that point, now I've written out this format here. If you've got the menu, the first row gets the three, the 11.5 goes on the second round row for the upper bound, and then the mean and the standard deviation occupy the third and the fourth row. But if you don't have the menu, you're just typing it in as you see it here. And the correct answer should be 0 0.5270 little over 52%. I've shaded a little bit more than half the area underneath the curve. Likewise, I've got a new mean and a new standard deviation. Find the area to the right of 7.5. So there's my picture. I put five as the mean down. I put my 7.5 in and I shaded to the right of it. And I'm trying to find the area. So I wrote alpha equals question mark this time. So again, you can guess, I would like you to actually pause again the video, write down what you think we're gonna type into the calculator and then check yourself here in a second. So we're gonna have normal CDF from 7.5 up to positive infinity represented by this 1E99. Again, to enter that in your calculator, you're gonna hit one, you're gonna hit your second EE, which is above the comma key, but only a single E will show up on your screen. And then you type in nine, nine. Then the mean and the standard deviation of five and two, and your solution should be 0 0.1056. About 10% of the area under the curve, 10 and a half percent has been shaded. Okay, these are the basics. And after that, we start getting into some word problems and things like that. Um, but I have one more problem and you can see that it's an inverse norm. I'm giving you a mean of 150 and a standard deviation of 20. I'm saying find the X value. Now the letter X is appropriate here because we wouldn't find a Z value because Z is reserved for the standard normal curve when mu is zero and sigma equals one. So finding the X value, that is the right variable for me to be using. That has area 0 0.1056 to the left. So in other words, I'm giving you the area and I'm saying, what's this value of X, which below it has the 10 and a half percent? when the mean is 150. Since you are given the area, that tells you it's gonna be the inverse norm feature. So there's my area. Here we go with the mu and the standard deviation. And you know what? Left isn't necessary here because it's automatically assumed to be the left unless it's told otherwise. But if you do have that, question on your calculator screen, just go with left. And your answer on this question should be 124.9945. And notice how that is below the 150, which seems to match our picture here. It seems like an appropriate answer. The next one is a word problem, probably not the most eloquently worded since I made this up. But it says, assume the mean length of an adult cat's tail is 13 and a half inches with a standard deviation of 1.5. I gave you the mean and I gave you the standard deviation. Complete this sentence. 13%, I'm giving you a percentage of adult cats have tails that are longer than blank inches. I'm asking you to find an X value and I've given you this percentage which can be interpreted as an area. And if I were to draw this out, there's my 13% to the right of some unknown value, which I'm calling X, when the mean is at 13.5. So percentages and areas in this chapter pretty much go hand in hand together because a percentage is an area, uh, the percentage of area shaded under the curve, but since probabilities add up to one, just like percentages add up to 100%, areas and probabilities and percentages kind of all go together. Now in this problem, because I gave you the area to the right, you're gonna have to do one of two things. Now I've written this out in two different ways. The top row says 13% to the right, but if you don't have that word right on your calculator, you're subtracting the 0.13 away from one and you're doing it to the left because basically 87% of the area under the curve is to the left of the value. 
When you do this on your calculator, we should get an answer of 15.1896 inches. Okay, so we have a little bit of a word problem application starting to take over here. Okay, now we're gonna move on to more word problems and interpretations that go along with this. And I'm telling you that a population is said to be normally distributed if percentages of the population are approximately equal to area under the normal curve. Things that tend to occur naturally, such as heights and IQ scores, things out in nature tend to be normally distributed. And I'm using the word tend to be, I'm not saying they are, Okay, because I'm being careful about that. I'm not allowed to declare normality. So here we go. Assume the heights of US males over 18 years old are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 69.3 inches. That's actually five foot 9.3 inch, inches and a standard deviation of 2.8 inches. Find the probability of US men between six foot and six foot four. Well, notice how our mean and standard deviation were in terms of inches. So I took the six foot and wrote it as 72 inches and six foot four I wrote as 76 inches. If you want a picture that goes with it, here's my 72 and 76 and I'm trying to find that area. The curve is centered at 68. Well, I said 68, but it would be 69.3 inches. This is actually one of the problems that I updated and we might find that I've actually got the wrong value on a calculator too if I didn't correct it properly. And if I didn't, I will make amends in a little bit. So that should be a 69.3. And so now on our calculator, let's see what we got. Whoops, you see, there we go. I did not go and update these values. So my apologies for poor preparation on this video. This would be normal CDF between 72 and 76 when the mean is the 69.3 and the standard deviation is 2.8 inches. Okay, so that's what we're gonna type into our calculator. And I'm not gonna trust that value right there, quite honestly. So let's go and check this on our calculator very briefly. And I apologize that I'm doing this on the fly. I don't wanna go and do a remake of the entire video just for this one problem that I updated. I actually went online to find out what the mean and standard deviation was for heights of men. So here we go. We go into the second distribution down to normal CDF. I'm going to type in 72 to 76. And at that point, I'm going to enter in the mean, which is 69.3. And our standard deviation of 2.8 inches. And I'm gonna hit paste at that point, hit enter, and oh my gosh, those values are different. So let me take a quick screenshot of that and bring us back over to our blue screen. And I'm going to erase off those numbers that we see right there because we don't want those values at all. We want instead, to have these values that I'm gonna make much bigger here in just a second. There we go. So here we go, what do we got? We've got 0 0.1591, that's in decimal form. And find the percentage, that would be 15.91% of adult US males, okay? Drop my pen. Okay, let's move to the next example here. They tell us that the mean travel time to work in New York State is 29 minutes. Let X be the time in minutes that it takes a randomly selected New Yorker to get to work on a randomly selected day. If times are normally distributed, which we need to be able to do these normal curve problems with a standard deviation of 9.3, find the probability that X, the randomly selected New Yorker, on a random day will travel less than 45 minutes. So I decided to start with a picture. 
Now, 29 was the mean, 45 is way off to the right. So when I drew this picture, I'm going, ooh, this is gonna be a high probability or a high percentage here because it's almost all the area under the curve shaded. So for my picture, I'm gonna say, let's go from negative infinity to 45 with the mean of 29 and a standard deviation of 9.3. Now, obviously there's no such thing as a travel time of negative infinity, okay? And there's not even a negative travel time. So quite honestly, that doesn't make sense, but we still do that when we do these calculations. You'll probably find if you were to on this calculator, just change that to a zero, your answer would almost be about the same, but we're not gonna go there. So in this case, our answer is about 95, 96%, 0.9573, which is what we suspected the answer was gonna be when we read this. Now the second part says, okay, same picture centered at 29. Let's find the probability that the travel time is between 20 and 30 minutes. So maybe not the best picture having been drawn. I'm not trying to be an art artist here. Um, the normal curve is going to be normal CDF between 20 and 30. There's my lower and upper bound when the mean is 29 and the standard deviation is 9.3 again. This turns out to be 0.36. 3762. And notice that looks a little bit better. It seems to match our per picture pretty well. Now we're being asked to interpret in part C the results from A and B. And I've actually typed these out in advance. Um, so let's take a look at my interpretation on this first one, which was the less than 45. Okay. We'd be saying there's a 95.73% chance that a random New Yorker will travel less than 45 minutes to work. Now that was for a randomly selected New Yorker. We actually have another interpretation and that could be that 95.73% of all the New Yorkers will travel less than 45 minutes. That's kind of a general statement about all the travelers, 95.73%. 73% of them versus the particular chance for one particular worker. Likewise, on part B, this probability that we have here, there's a 37.62% chance that a random New York traveler will travel between 20 to 30 minutes to work. As we start moving into the second half of this course, we are gonna to have to deal with words. We're going to need to describe our confidence intervals and the different types of things that we're gonna be creating in words. Math is great as a subject on its own, but if you can't communicate what the results are, which sometimes need to be done in words, you've lost a whole bunch of what we're trying to do here. Okay, couple more word problems. It says the weights of a certain type of adult bird are approximately normally distributed, thank you, with a mean of, here we go, and a standard deviation. What proportion will weigh between 1100 and 1200 grams? Okay, they're giving us the lower and the upper bound and I've actually drawn a picture here and actually, I didn't draw the picture, but I've wrote, written, written this out. There's my lower and upper bound, 1,100 to 1,200. Then I entered my mean. Then I entered my standard deviation. So that should be a straightforward calculation on your calculator. And 0 0.0866 as a decimal, as a percentage, we always move the decimal two places to the right. Odds are on the test, we will be leaving these in decimal form unless I ask you to write it as a percentage instead. In part B, what is the probability that a randomly selected bird will weigh more than 1,500 grams? Oh, more than 1,500. That's gonna go from 1,500 to positive infinity without the picture, but hopefully you can visualize that. And then I've got my mean and my standard deviation listed there. And there we have it 0.2328 or 23.28%. Now part C asks a question in a slightly different way. Is it unusual 
for an adult bird of this type to weigh more than 1,550 grams? Well, let's find the probability. When you go and do the probability, 1550 to infinity, that's the greater than 1550, you get 0.1482. So there still is about a 15% chance. And that's not, it's not super common, but it's not super uncommon either. So I'm not, I'm gonna say it's not too unusual as far as what that means. Now, the understanding that this is not too unusual is another key idea that's going to kind of be moving us into questions and thoughts we're going to have later in this class. Okay, part uh, or this next question, and I'm pretty sure it is the last question, at least on this video. I split the chapter into two parts here because the second half is a little bit more of an investigative half with some a uh, little bit deeper of the mathematics. Um, but in this problem here, to qualify to become a security guard at a certain firm, applicants need to be tested for stress tolerance. The scores are normally distributed and they give us the mean and the standard deviation. And it says only the top 15% are selected. Find the cutoff score. So I drew a picture and I said, okay, the top 15%. I want to know question mark right beneath the curve here, what is that value that separates the top 15% away from the rest when it's centered at 61? So I know my answer is gonna be above 61. Now, because I gave you an area, this is gonna be shading to the right and it's gonna be the inverse norm. And depending upon your calculator, if you have the ability to mention that it's to the right, you'll just use the 0.15, but you're going to subtract from one and have 0.85 or this one minus 0.15 if we're going to be finding the area to the left by default. And when you do this on your calculator, you get 62, sorry, 69. 0.2915, which that 69 is to the right of 61, as we would have suspected. Now, the problems are going to change quite a bit in the next video where we dive a little bit deeper, but this lays the foundation for the unit.